Uh, known this guy for a long, long time. Mr. Daniel Thomas Plesak, born in Gary, Indiana, back in 1962. I can't believe he's 61. I, I, I can't believe it. He grew up not too far down the road from there in Crown Point, Indiana. Started baseball, basketball, track, attended NC State University. Uh, is in the Wolfpack Hall of Fame, in fact. He was the first-round draft pick by the Milwaukee Brewers in 1983 as a starting pitcher out of NC State. But once he arrived in the big leagues two and a half years later, he became one of the game's most dominant closers out of the bullpen, elected to the All-Star Game three times, and to this day is the Brewers' all-time leader in game saves, ERA, strikeouts per nine innings. Since retiring, many of you watch him regularly, a familiar face on the MLB network. We talked about yesterday's even a big league operator in the video game, The Show. He's broadcast All-Star Games, World Series games on Major League Baseball's international feed. He's also an avid horse trainer and near and dear to my heart. He's a lover of animals and horses. He's rescued many neglected horses through the years. That's my kind of man. It's a real man. Pleasure to be joined by Dan <laughs> Police act. Danny, it's great to see you, man. How you doing? Tom, it is great to catch up with you, man. It seems like yesterday at Wrigley Field, I mean, I, I just, I, I, it just amazes me how fast that time goes by. And I, I, I mean, a big fan of yours and your father's as much as you've done in a game of baseball. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you again. It's been too long in between talks. Let's put yes, it that way. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. It's great. You don't, you don't age a day. I mean, I say that seriously. I mean, you really don't look much different than the guy that, 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 that you know, I'd be sitting on the bench at Wrigley Field and just talking about baseball or about life or on the team bus or whatever it might be. You look great taking good care of yourself. Yeah, Tom, you know what? I think um, one of the things that this job has done for me, and I got to admit, like, we had some conversations when I played with the Cubs and um, it, it, this, this, the broadcasting thing is an entirely different animal. And I think if you want to be good at it, you want to take care of your body the best that you can, because the hours can be late. I'm on the late 10 to 1 AM most of the night. And, uh, one of the things that sports do, Tom, I think it keeps you young and it keeps you thinking and it keeps you vibrant and you try and stay in touch with the younger players today, what they're doing, mix in what I did, what they did. Um, and, uh, it's been good. It, it really has. If you would have told me when I retired in 2003, like, you know, I was doing, I did Cubs pre and post game for a couple of years. Yep. So then this MLB network thing came about and it was a big change moving from the Midwest out to New Jersey. But I will have to say this. It's crazy to think that this is year 15 at MLB network. And I can honestly tell you, Tom, I enjoy it as much now as I did year one in 2009. It, it's a great place to work. I, I, I want to circle back to that uh, in, in just a little bit, but I always love asking the guys who join us on the program for what we call the big interview every Wednesday. Um, take us back to Crown Point, Indiana. I mentioned you were, you, were, you were born in Gary, but Crown Point's your hometown. What was family life like in the police sack home growing up? Tom, you know what? Probably a lot like every other kid in the Midwest and probably what you did. You know, my father worked. He was a steel worker. My mom cut hair. She was a beautician. I had two brothers, one older, one younger. Sports was a big part of our family. Um, it was a different time, like I'm sure in your childhood, where, you, you know, there, there wasn't the video games and the, and the iPhones and the technology that we had. You got together with your buddies. You went down to the basketball court. You played shirts and skins. You, you, you know, you, you got four or five guys together. You went down to the local baseball field. One guy pitched, one guy hit, one guy played the outfield. And it was just, I, I think it was a simpler time. And, and I look back at it now and I think about, you know, what I had as a kid. And I was very, very grateful and very thankful that, you know, my mom and dad, they worked hard. I could remember till it was like it was yesterday, Tom. There was a stage I was in, probably eighth and ninth grade, where I really got into hockey. Don't ask me why. Like you know, being six five, uh, a hockey player probably wasn't in the cards, but I just got really into hockey. And I remember one Christmas, I got a Bobby Orr jersey, hockey jersey, Boston Bruins. And then I thought I was going to be the next guy that was going to be the big star in the NHL. And I look back at it now, and it was just a simpler time, Crown mm -hmm. Point, Indiana kind of mainstream, small town, Midwest. Um, but all my memories of my childhood, Tom, were really good ones. Um, 
you, you, we mentioned you, you were a great athlete in multiple sports, uh, and that's normally the case when you see any professional athlete in any sport is that, you know, when they were growing up, they were playing a little bit of everything. It seems like it's become so, you know, focused on one sport, you know, now with kids and, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, what ultimately led you to the decision that baseball was going to be it? Anything in particular, or you were just better at that than everything else? No, I, I wasn't, Tom. As a matter of fact, um, I tell this story quite often. I actually signed a letter of intent to play basketball at NC State. Basketball was really my first love in high school. And after my junior year, I went to an all-star game camp in Milledgeville, Georgia, the BC All-Star Camp, where I was kind of seen by a lot, a lot of national, you know, it put me kind of on the map. And I was a really good basketball player. And Norm Sloan was the head coach at NC State. Monty Tao was his assistant coach. They were on the national championship team in 1974, Monty Tao. They came to watch me play. They offered me a scholarship. I signed a national letter of intent to play basketball at NC State. So going into my senior year, I signed the letter of intent like in November, right before my senior season started. Went through the year. Things were great. Then spring came around, and I played first base in outfield on the baseball team at Crown Point High School. We didn't have anybody to pitch. And our, our coach at the time, Dick Webb, came up to me and he said, hey, listen, we don't have anybody that can pitch. And I know from what you, I heard when you grew up in Gary in Little League, you were a pitcher. Would you want to pitch? We're looking for some guys to pitch. And I said, well, yeah, I guess I'll do it. Okay. So, Tom, this is the honest to God's truth. I didn't have any training. I didn't have a curveball. I didn't have a slider. I look back at an old newspaper clipping from that day, and I remember telling a reporter, he asked me what my off-speed pitch was. I said, well, I'm, I'm tinkering around a little bit with a knuckleball. So I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So I, I start a game like this is the late part of March, strike out like 15 guys in seven innings. That turns into like one more game of 17 strikeouts. To make a long story short, I get drafted in the second round by the, by the St. Louis Cardinals out of high school. Now, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm just out there throwing. I had no training. I had other than really my dad or friends that, hey, you ought to try this delivery, this windup. I didn't know anything about pitching. I just, it was just a natural thing that happened. So I get drafted and I'm like, well, what do I do? And I remember the, the Mo Mazzilli was the scout that was in, in, brought in that signed, who I tried to sign me. And Dell Maxwell was the GM of the St. Louis Cardinals. So they come to, I get drafted in June draft, and it's the days of it being on MLB Network. That was, forget about it. I found I got out, I got drafted the next day with a Western Union mailgram saying that, hey, congratulations, you've been selected as the 42nd player in the, in the baseball draft by the St. Louis Cardinals Baseball Club. So the Cardinals get in touch with me. We're going back and forth, and this is how crazy it is, Tom. The initial offer was 25000 I was the 42nd player in the draft. And I told them that I would sign for 50. And they said, we can't give you 50 because our first round draft pick was a high school kid out of Virginia Beach, Virginia. We gave him 50 and we certainly can't give you 50 if we gave our first round pick 50. So I said, okay, forget about it. I'm going to go to NC State. And all of a sudden now I'm thinking maybe I should change and start to play baseball. Norm Sloan leaves NC State and he takes the head coaching job at the University of Florida. Monty Tao goes with him. So now I'm like, man, what do I do now? So now I'm gonna, I'm thinking maybe this baseball thing is the way for me to go. So we get down towards the end of August. I'm about two weeks from going to my first class at NC State. The Cardinals call me back and, and they're like, okay, listen, uh, Del Maxville was the GM. He called me and my parents and said, listen, we've got about a week to get this done. What's your fine? I said, it's gonna, I need 50 grand and that incentive bonus package, which was like $7,500. You get 2,000 if you make it to A ball out of double A. And if you get to the big leagues, you get another $5,000. So I said, okay, um, I'm, I'm gonna take it. So Mo Mazzelli and Del Maxville make the drive from St. Louis, Missouri to Crown Point, Indiana, Tom, for me to sign the contract. And the night before, my mom said to me, are you sure you wanna do this? And I said, not really. I don't even know if I like baseball that much. And she said, well, listen, you need to go to college. If you're not ready to play baseball and you're not sure, then I think it's time for you. To, you, you make the decision. Now, my dad wanted me to sign. 
Everybody in my family wanted me to sign. And I decided when they came into the house, they sat down, Tom, in my living room. And I can remember it like it was yesterday. And they put the contract out and I told them, uh, I'm not going to sign. And they told me, they asked me why. And I told them, I'm not ready. I need to go to college. I, I haven't been doing this baseball thing long enough. And they tried to convince me that, listen, we are going to make you a big league pitcher. You, you're like a diamond in the rough. You haven't mm -hmm. done a whole lot of training in baseball, but that's our job is to get it out of you. And Tom, they couldn't talk me out of it. I was convinced, nope, I'm going to go to college. I decided to go to NC State. And wouldn't you know, that was the first year Jim Valvano became the head coach of the basketball team at NC State. So I arrive in campus in September. I still kind of have the basketball itch. And the head baseball coach at NC State, Sam Esposito, said to me, I really don't want you to play on the basketball team and walk on because we'd like your time to be dedicated to baseball. So he said, but I'll tell you what, why don't you go down to the gym next week and there, these guys are working out, they're practicing, go to the gym and go ahead and see what you think. So I went there and Tom, I got on the floor with Kozo McQueen, Terry Gannon, Thrill Bailey, Derek Wittenberg, Sidney Lowe. And I'm like, man, this is, this is a, this is a totally different league. I think this baseball thing is where I'm going. And Tom, I made the, I, I made the right move. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a team that won the national championship shortly thereafter. It, 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 Tom, exactly. So I'm working out with these guys like the second day, and I, Tom, I can't get a shot off. I, and I'm telling you, I was a good shooter, six five guard. I could not get a shot off. And I'm telling you, when Lorenzo Charles, who had the dunk at the buzzer, yep. right, was guarding me, Tom, I couldn't get a shot off. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I, maybe this baseball thing, this is the ticket because. I've got no chance to play here. I, Tom, there was no way that I, I kind of, I guess I outkicked my punt coverage. I should have chosen maybe a small mid-major if I was going to do basketball, but the basketball thing wasn't going to work for me, I can tell you that. All right, so now all of a sudden, you, you got to tell Valvano, and they had given you a scholarship, right? So all of a sudden yes. now, uh, you know, what happened at that point? I mean, the baseball coach clearly had already told you he wants you to play baseball. Had he already said yes. to you, hey, look, you know, if you don't want to do the basketball thing, we got some money with baseball, although we all know yes. baseball doesn't spend the kind of money scholarship-wise that basketball does, especially in those days at NC State. Yeah, Tom, I was very lucky in this, is um, – they transferred my scholarship from basketball to baseball. But what helped is when you get drafted in the second round and you're the 42nd player in the draft, there's a pretty good idea. They know that you've got some talent and you're going to be able to play on the baseball team. So they switched my scholarship from basketball to baseball. And the rest, as they say, is history. It really is because shortly thereafter, what, three years later, right? You're drafted in the first round. Um, what happened in those in those three years that all of a sudden? I mean, you were already a second round pick, so clearly somebody saw raw. Yes, not a lot of baseball experience. Yes, but you're six five. You're left hander. You're throwing the ball through the through the wall. But what happened that made the difference that that, that put you in line to now all of a sudden be looked at as a first round pick and a guy that the Brewers thought this is going to be a big league pitcher for us for a long time. <sighs> Well, Tom, it's it's funny. It's that's a great question because in those days at NC State, we didn't even have a pitching coach. We had grad assistant coaches. So our head coach was Sam Esposito. Our grad assistant coach was a great guy, Ray Tanner, who eventually was the head coach at NC State, went over to the University of South Carolina, won a couple of national championships with the Gamecocks. I, I think what it was was being around better players. I didn't I, I'm be blunt and perfectly honest with you. The instruction that the college players get is far superior than the days when I was at NC State. It was a lot of trial and error. You watched what guys did, other guys, read books, watched some videos if you could, and it was kind of self-taught. The biggest thing that happened in my career, there are two things, uh, Tom, and I, I don't want to get off topic, but two guys I, I, I have to bring into focus. The first was Mike Pazic, who was the minor league pitching coordinator for the Brewers. I signed with the Brewers in 1983. I go to rookie ball, and I'm in rookie ball camp in Paintsville, Kentucky. And, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little disappointed I'm in the rookie league in the Appalachian League because I was a first-round pick out of NC State. I'm basically playing with a lot of high school kids in the rookie ball in the Appalachian League. And Mike Pasek came to me after about my fourth or fifth start. He says, you know, 
you throw the ball really hard, but we we got to we got to change some things. You know, you, you're spraying the ball all over the place. What I want to do with you the next time you start it, I'm going to be here for a week. I want you to throw at like 80%. I want you to throw strike one, strike two, and you're not, I don't want you to really let one go till you get two strikes. So if you want to go ahead and throw 95, but let's get strike one, strike two, then go ahead and throw one 100 and throw it to the backstop. I don't care where it goes, if that's what you want to do, but you have to learn how to pitch and stop throwing. And Tom, it's like a light went off. So I started all of a sudden, if I wanted to throw that 95 and let it go, I had to like control it, back it off and get strike one. I had a pretty good slider, not a really good one. That developed a little bit later on. But all of a sudden what I started to do as a strike one, strike two, 89, 92, and then bam, 95 looked 100. And it, it was like, wow, it was starting. I was starting to be able to pitch and not throw. So fast forward a year later, I'm in uh, A ball in Stockton, California. And my manager was a guy that had a little cup of coffee in the big leagues named Tim Norbrook. And at the all-star game that year at the halfway point, I'm going to start the all-star game for the North division of the California league, right? So I'm in Stockton, California in A ball. And I'm thinking right now I'm, I'm from the Digby tribe. Like I'm loving myself. Like I'm, um, I've already conquered rookie ball. I was the rookie ball player of the year, which I should have been because I was probably the only 21-year-old in the Appalachian <laughs> League. Now, right? Now I'm in I'm in a California league, and I'm thinking like my stuff is I'm I'm good to go, right? So I pitch this game, the All-Star game in the California league, and pitch a couple innings, throw the ball really well. So we get back to Stockton, and um, you know, as a starting pitcher back in those days, you had the bucket duty. And if your listeners don't know what that is, if you're the starting pitcher on Monday, on Tuesday, the next day, your job was to stand behind the screen during batting practice. And when they would throw the balls in, you would put them in a bucket and you would run that bucket when it was full back into the bullpen or back to the bullpen, the pitcher, the batting practice pitcher, and dump those balls in a bucket. And those were the balls they threw to the hitter. So I'm standing behind the screen. The balls are coming in. And Tim Norbrook comes walking up to me and, and he says to me, he says, uh, he goes, hey, uh, do you remember your first girlfriend? I said, yeah, Mary Kay Thanos. I went to prom with her. And he said, did you love her? And I said, I, I think so. I, I don't know. How much do you know about love when you're 18? And he says, well, you know what you got to do? You got to take your arms and you got to wrap your arms around the game of baseball, just like you did Mary Kay Thanos. And I'm like, what the hell was that? And he walked away. And he always had this like open door policy, right? So it, it really bugged me, Tom, for like two days. And so I walked in his office. I said, hey, I got to ask you something. What, what was that all about? You call him, what, what's the matter? He goes, yeah. He goes, you know what? You don't need, you, you shouldn't even be in the California league right now. You should be in El Paso. Because you know what your problem is? If we have, if we have a workout, we have a game, workout reporting time is at one o'clock. You're there at 1245. When the workout's over, you're gone. You're never here early. You're never here late. If we tell you to run 10 sprints, you run your 10, but you never run 12. You never run 15. And he goes, you got to start falling in love with this. Like, it's not just show up and be ready to get dressed and get on the field. You know, take it, you know, take an interest in pitching, take an interest in the game. And Tom, he called me out. And from that point forward, I remember this like it was yesterday. We went on a, we went on a road trip to Visalia, California to play the Visalia Twins. And near the hotel where we stayed was a bookstore. I went in that bookstore and I still have the book and I get chills when I think about it. It was the book, The Art of Pitching by Tom Seaver. That book, Tom, I've read that book from front to cover a thousand times in my life. And it opened the game of baseball to me, like what Tom Seaver, what his approach was, what his mechanics were what he looked at when he looked at a hitter, how he held his bat, what his swing path was like, what to do between games, how to prepare yourself mentally, how to get those big three or four outs in a crucial part of the game, how to save some gas in the beginning of the game so you have some in the middle of the game when you need a big strikeout. And Tom, that book and Tim Norbrook woke me up. That's all I can tell you. Well, let me ask you this, though. Uh, Tom Seaver, obviously, you know, Hall of Fame pitcher, one of the all-time greats. You were a starting pitcher then. Uh, I'm not assuming that a lot of the lessons in that book uh, could not apply to a reliever, but clearly, Seaver's, you know, where he's coming from, and the only thing that he knew was as a starting pitcher. 
that's what you were then. Now, all of a sudden, shortly thereafter, and you weren't in the minor leagues very long. You might have started at the lowest level down there in the Appalachian League. But, I mean, you were blistering through right away. How did you become a reliever? <laughs> I make the team in 1986 out of spring training as the fifth starter, Tom. George Bamberger was the manager of the Brewers. I make the team. I find out on Saturday I'm, I'm breaking with the club. So the, I go to camp. I'm really about the fifth or sixth best pitching spot prospect in the Brewers system at that time. The number one guy was Tim Leary. Then there was Jamie Kokenauer, Juan Nieves, Chris Basio. There were, at that time, Bill Wegman, a Cincinnati guy. Yep. The, the Brewers were stacked in the minor leagues. So I really was like number six on that list of prospects. I go to camp and – I'm, I'm throwing the ball pretty well. I, a week goes by, and then George Bamber comes up to me and he says, "Hey, uh, you, you're gonna, you know, we're gonna start you every, you know, four or five days." And the guy that was in charge of me, uh, boy, you bring up so many good Ted Simmons. So oh, every boy. game, wow, now there's a name, man. That's one of the great names <sighs> of all time that not many people talk about. I don't mean to interrupt you, but wow, no. wow. So when spring training starts, he catches me on the side, and only the way. The game of baseball was in the 80s, right? If you can picture this, here I am right out of double A, and I'm throwing my first bullpen session, and George Bamberger, the manager, walks up to me. He says, hey, kid, nice to meet you. He goes, hey, I want you to meet Ted Simmons. He's going to catch you here during spring training. And I, Tom, God strike me dead. It was one of the funniest things ever, and I thought, man, this is this is grown man baseball. Ted Simmons is catching me in my first bullpen with a cigarette going <laughs> – Taking a puff, catching the ball, throwing it back. I'm like, man, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I mean, he's he's catching my best heater, and he's got a smack going, just bam, throwing it back to me. I'm like, man, these guys are good in the big leagues, right? So the first game I pitched in, Ted, yeah, Teddy Hager is supposed to, first, to pitch the first uh, game in the Cactus League for the Brewers, right? He comes up and gets sick, and they come up to me. This is the first spring training game. And they come up to me and they go, hey, you're going to start the game. I am as nervous as could be. And all I could remember was Ted Simmons. He had his mask on his top of his head. We get done throwing. We're walking out. He said, kid, hit my glove and don't shake me off. Tom, it was like surreal. The first hitter, it was Brian Downing. I grew up a White Sox fan, man. And I remember Brian Downing with that open stance. He was the first incredible Hulk in baseball, right? And I remember going... Holy shit, that's Brian Downing. Like, I'm I'm looking at Brian Downing from 60 feet, six <laughs> inches away. And I so I pitched three innings, nine up, nine down. Five days later, I'm pitching well. I mean, I hadn't given up a run. So there's a week left in camp, and we have a day off, and they tell me, hey, we want you to go down to minor league camp, and you're going to throw against the Giants AAA team. So I thought, all right, you know what? This was great. As every young player will tell you in the big leagues, your goal is every Monday, you get that meal money, 700 bucks, you know you're good for another week. And that money goes a long way when you don't have any money. That's $700. That's like you just hit the lottery, right? So I go down to the minor league game and they tell me, hey, just uh, come to the ballpark, get dressed, and Bill Schroeder's going to go over with you. And I'm like, wow, that's odd. So he now he's mad because this is the one day off. Now he's got to go catch me in a AAA game. So we drive over to Phoenix where the Giants minor league camp is. And I've never even pitched in triple A, Tom. I went rookie ball, A ball, double A. So now I'm in big league camp with two weeks left, and I'm going to throw against the Phoenix uh, Giants, their triple A team, at the minor league facility. And I'm like, okay. So I'm warming up, and Bill Shorter goes, hey, we got to take this serious now. And, Tom, I get on the mound, and I'm taking my warm-ups, and all of a sudden I walk in, and I see, uh-oh, Harry Dalton, GM, George Bamberger, manager. Bud Selig, owner, right? Herm Sturette, pitching coach, they all came to watch me pitch. And I'm like, whoo, then I started getting a little nervous. And all I told myself was just, you know, what Ted Simmons told me, just hit the glove. Tom, I pitched six innings, 18 up, 18 down, didn't give up a hit. And I walked away from there and I'm like, wow, we're driving back in a car in Bill Shorter's car. This is almost like a scene from a movie, right? Two big league guys driving in Mason full beauty. Pulling the Burger King to get a Whopper, right? <laughs> and probably going, what the hell are these guys doing? These guys are taking that fan thing to a different level, right? <laughs> like, hey, we're for the Brewers, right? I want a, you know what? I want a double Whopper, hearts, fried, and Coke. <laughs> so a week later, 
uh, uh, there's we're getting ready to break camp, and I get called in the office. Jimmy Bank, the traveling secretary, yep. calls me in. He says, they want to see you in the office. I walk in the office. There's Bud Selig. There's Harry Dalton and George Bamberger. We sit down, and they said, okay, you know there's 26 guys here. And he says, you know, you got to just do the math. He goes, I got to inform you. I mean, we just made a trade. We traded Moose Haas to the Oakland A's. So 26, including you, would be 25. Congratulations, you made the team. And I'm like, holy hell. So the plan was I was going to be the fifth starter in the month of April because we had every day off. It was Danny Darwin, Jaime Kokenauer, Teddy Higuera, Tom Candiotti were the four guys in the rotation. I was number five. And it so happened that they were like every Monday we were off. They didn't want to disrupt those guys. So they said, hey, we're going to put you in the bullpen, get your feet wet, and we're going to leave you there. And I got my first big league win against the Yankees. Came in, we were losing, Tom. I pitched four innings, 12 up, 12 down. Wow. We scored two runs in the bottom of the ninth. I got my first big league win. The game's over. I'm, I'm so happy. And all of a sudden, they say, hey, they want to see you in the office. And George Bamberger says, hey, kid, guess what? We're going to keep you in the bullpen. You're going to be our version of Dave Rigetti. We're going to take that change up, forget about it. I want you to go two pitches, fastball, slider. Tom, the rest is history. And 18 years later, I, I was a bullpen guy, and I bought into it. Did you buy into it right away? I mean, look, you know, no. you, I mean, you're no. just talking about some of the games you're having in the minor leagues. I mean, hell, we, we were talking earlier in the program. It's neither here nor there. But, I mean, you're pitching in spring training games six innings. You probably throw 90-something, 80-something pitches, right? You can't even get a lot yes. of big leaguers in major league games, regular season games now to get to six innings. Lord knows that around here in Cincinnati. But were you buying into – were you buying into this whole thing because you were a starting pitcher and obviously doing well at it? Disappointed at first, I'm going to be honest with you, because I was just learning, you know, that the changeup. It wasn't good, but it was getting better. And towards the end of big league spring training camp, I was actually able to like ball one. I could throw a changeup for a strike, and I'd get a wave and a swing and a miss. And I really started to see this thing coming together, this changing speeds thing. But I will tell you this, Tom, and you know me well. I'm I'm a more of a fast twitch guy. Like yeah. I don't do well sitting still, and I think I would have drove myself nuts uh, every five days. I'd look at it this way. I think the life of a big league starting pitcher is the greatest life if you're doing well. If you're having a miserable year and you've had four back to back starts, you know that are just awful. Those four days in between, Tom, can be hellacious. And one of the things I liked about the bullpen. You could have a bad game on Monday, but, boy, you could be right back in there on Tuesday and Wednesday and pitch really well and forget about it. I didn't buy into it at first, but I think it better fit the style of a my – per, it fit my personality better. I'm, I'm just not – I'm one of those fast energy guys. Like, I, I want to do it. I want to do it fast, and you can't operate like that being the starting pitcher. All right, so now all of a sudden uh, you're in the bullpen, and I mean success, Dan, comes fast. It comes it does. really fast. Um, you become eventually the closer. Now, the closer's role was a little bit different then than, than maybe it is now. You know, you'd have to get more than just three outs at the end of a game. Sometimes you were going two innings, maybe occasionally even three innings to get a save. Uh, but, but now all of a sudden, Dan, you're, you're going to all-star games every year. Yeah, Tom. I, yeah. It, uh, in 1987, I made my first all-star game. And I, I got to be honest with you, I'm – we, we ended the season, the first half of the season in Oakland. So I just stay in Oakland for the All-Star game. I get I get voted on the All-Star team by the managers, right? And I'm, I walk into – Tom, I got to tell you, it, it was like a surreal moment. I walk into the locker room, like I'm like kind of nervous. Like you walk in and you look on the wall and you see Clemens, Saberhagen, Nolan Ryan, Bruce Hurst. And it's like, what in the hell am I doing here, right? And, and I can remember – sitting there nervous when the game starts. I'm sitting down to bullpen and Brett Saberhagen was a starting pitcher for the American League. I watched him warm up and I'm sitting down there in the bullpen in Oakland, Tom, and I'm like, wow, how do you guys hit this stuff? I mean, Brett Saberhagen is one of the most underappreciated great pitchers. I yeah. mean, pound for pound, when he was healthy from like 1985 to like 1991, Tom, he was as dominant as any starting pitcher in the game of baseball. If he would have been pitching in New York or Boston, he would he would have been like, we would have looked at him in a different light. He was that good. And I remember 
you know, sitting there, he, he started a game and I'm nervous wreck sitting there and all of a sudden, bam, tie game, ninth inning, you got the ninth. And I'm like, whoo, I remember I faced uh, Bo Diaz flew out to right field. Dale Murphy popped up to third base and I struck out Hubie Brooks. And I remember coming off the field and I was just like a bundle of nerves. Like, and now it's a tie game. So I'm like, holy hell, like, Ooh, I wonder if I'm going to go back out there again. I hope this is just it because I don't want to <laughs> screw this game up, right? I'm, I'm being honest with you. I'm like, man, I don't want to get a loss in an All-Star game. I walk in, I sit down, and Jim Fergosi walks over to me, and he was one of the coaches. He said, hey, that's it, kid. Good job. And I was like, you know, and I wanted to say, hey, I could go another one, but I was like, the hell with that. I'm good. One scoreless, I'm out the door. <laughs> That is great, great stuff. But then and now you go to two more All-Star games. I mean, you know, now guys are probably young guys at that point. You were still a young man. But there are guys looking at you and saying, oh, please, Zach, man. We've been watching this guy the last three years. He's all over. Yeah. And, yeah, and, Tom, and, I mean, it, and that role changes quick, doesn't it? How you go from being that guy that's it, kind of in awe to all of a sudden being a guy where a lot of guys are looking at you that way? Yeah, it does, Tom. And, and you know, it, it's, it's funny because – I went to my second all-star game and I, I think that was kind of like, listen, we all have like games to say, Hey, you know what? Did your team win? I, you know, the, the game that I felt like really put me on the map was the 88 all-star game in Cincinnati. And I get to the field that day and, you know, Tom Kelly was the manager because the twins won the world series in 87. We have the meeting before the game and they're going about, Hey, how we're going to script the game. And TK comes up to me and says, hey, listen, man, I know you're having a great year, but it's literally a great story with Eckersley. And we're going to have that, you know, close games. So he goes, I'm going to get you in the game. And he goes, listen, Strawberry's your guy. Seventh inning on, he's your guy. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, so I'm sitting there the whole game, and I'm, you know, you're nervous. I mean, Tom, when you're in the life of the bullpen, man, especially in a close game, you know, you're in a day and age. In, in the 80s, when people watched the All-Star game in the World Series, there were a lot of eyeballs because there weren't, like, you know, Fox Sports, Cincinnati, and SNY, and Yes Network, and Nesson. There was like, you wanted to watch a baseball game, and you lived in Cincinnati or Crown Point, Indiana. You watched it on NBC. You watched the game of the week, and yep. you watched the All-Star game. And so I'm sitting there, and the game's going on, and it gets into the eighth inning, and I'm kind of looking at the lineup, and I get up, and I start throwing just in case Strawberry comes, right? He's hitting fourth in the inning. And I'm like, all right, whatever. So there's two outs, and Willie McGee's up, and he hits a ground ball to first base to Don Mattingly, right? Who's like the surest thing ever in baseball, right? And he bobbles it, he boots it, and all of a sudden now I'm like, holy shit, Strawberry's up next. So I rapid fire like five or six really quick. They bring me in a game. Tom Kelly hands me the ball, and the first thing he told me, he goes, remember what we talked about earlier in the scouting report? I said, yeah. So Tom, he tells me, listen, your guy Strawberry, he's a really good low ball hitter. Just try to throw that thing belt high to chest high, and you'll get him to swing right through it. Be careful down in the zone. No problem. So I get the ball. He comes out. He hands me the ball, and he goes, hey, you know the plan? I go, yep, just elevate the heater. Let Tom, I couldn't have thrown three knee-high heaters. I was aiming <laughs> at his chest. <laughs> God, I'm telling you, I threw three fastballs at his knees. He swung right through all three of them. And I'm like, how the hell did I just do that? The coolest thing ever, we're staying at the Westin in Cincinnati. And I remember, like, I get back to the room after a game. I'm like, you know, I'm pacing back and forth. I'm like a caged lion thinking, man, I just struck out strawberry, right? Like, yeah, well, this is this is great. So I ordered, I remember, I ordered a club sandwich. And they bring a club sandwich and fries. The guy knocks on the door again. He goes, here's your dessert. And I'm like, my dessert? Tom, the hotel put me, a, made me a piece of cheesecake. And they script and they wrote on it in red, like whatever food coloring, strawberry dessert. Congratulations. And you know, in the day and age now, I wish I would have had a cell phone then and taken a picture of that. Yeah. But it was one of the, it was one of the coolest things ever. And yeah. that was that was like my game. That was my game, like that I, I, I came out like that was my coming out party was the eighty eight All Star game. That is really, really cool. Uh, you, you, you're in three of them, and now what happens, Dan, after that? I mean, I, I was not yet announcing big league games. It was shortly thereafter that I was. But you, you go from bam, 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 all-star games, boom, closer boom. to the Milwaukee Brewers. What happened? Well, interesting story. And it, it, a lot happened, and I talked to a guy yesterday. I don't know if you remember a, a catcher. He was the best catcher I ever threw to. 
a guy named Charlie O'Brien. Of course. Caught a lot of the Braves yep. guys. So we used to do this thing where we would play long toss from one pole to the other at County Stadium. He would stand on the right field pole. I'd stand on the left field pole. And we would play long toss. And, I mean, that's how you're young and you're strong. And, Tom, I could throw a ball from foul pole to foul pole on a line in my sleep. And I had just come back from the 89 All-Star game in Anaheim. And I had pitched a lot right before the break. I pitched in that game, faced one guy, gave up a hit to Von Hayes. Came back day after the All-Star break. I'm a little tired. Charlie O'Brien says, hey, let's go play long toss. I'm like, ah, he goes, oh, man, come on. So I'm like, okay. And I remember throwing a ball, Tom, and I threw it. I'm like, ooh, man, that didn't feel good, right? Back of my shoulder, I'm like, ooh, wee, what was that? So about two days later, I don't get in a couple of games. This thing really starts barking. So I don't know what it is. I finally have to tell the Brewers, hey, listen, got something going on in here. This is, you know, this thing's killing me. They asked me how I did it. I said, playing catch. They did it, you know, x-rays, MRI, all that, showed no tear. I had really bad tendonitis. Took a cortisone shot, away we go. And Tom, for the next like two years, that thing hurt every day. That thing hurt every day at 90, 91, 92. And I don't know how I did it. With smoke and mirrors in 1992, I had a really good year. Phil Garner was the manager, but my shoulder, I wasn't right. But I was just uh, gutting it up, taking 10, 15 aspirin. Any anti-inflammatory you could take, I took. And I know you're going to say, well, why didn't you say anything? You do. I got a great story. My rookie year, we're in, we're, we're in Oakland, and we're, going to, we're in Toronto going to Oakland, and Robin Yount had turf toe really bad. So after the last game in the Toronto series, on a Sunday, I walk in the training room, and I see Robin Yount on a table, and I see this needle about six inches long. They're going to stick it in his toe, and I'm like, oh, man, that has to hurt. So two days later, Tuesday, we're in Oakland in batting practice, and, you know, I don't know what to say. This is Robin Yount. Like, him and Molitor, if they didn't talk to you, you weren't going to go like, hey, Paulie, how you doing today? Like, if, <laughs> you know, you just kind of close your mouth and, hey, whatever. So I'm standing here in the outfield, and I didn't know how to ask him. But I said, hey, hey, Robin, that shot hurt? He goes, yeah. I go, wow. I go, hey, you're in the lineup. He goes, yeah. Why wouldn't I be? He goes, hey, can I ask you something? I said, yeah. He goes, did you ever fake being sick when you were a kid and your mom and dad would go off to work and, you duped them, and then when they left, you got up. I said, oh, hell yeah, everybody did that. He goes, that's how it is in baseball. You find out how easy it is to take a day off, you'll just keep doing it over and over again. And he walked away from me. And I was like, wow, lesson learned. So <laughs> I, you know what it was, Tom? It was bullheadedness for me in like 1989 to 90. I should have just really said, hey, this thing isn't right. Let's really get it looked at, really rest it. But I just felt like, Tom, if I could breathe and I could throw – I was going to pitch, and it was the demise of me. I signed as a free agent with the Cubs, had a good year with Milwaukee. I signed with the Cubs. I don't know why the hell I signed with them. They had Paul Asenmacher, Chuck McElroy, myself, and Randy Myers. You've got five guys in a bullpen. Four of them are left-handed, but the, the appeal of playing at home, it, it, it got to me. Like, I got a chance to play for the Cubs. Why wouldn't I do it? And it probably wasn't the right move. Um, it was too really... Tough years for me. I, I wasn't pitching a lot. And when I did pitch, I pitched crappy. Um, I was getting back healthy. One of the things, Brett Fisher, who was a strength and conditioning guy, yep. saved my career. Saved my career, Tom. So right before spring training starts, they send all the free agent guys to Mesa to work out. And they do these tests on my shoulder. And I can tell they're like, what the hell? You guys signed this guy. This guy's broken. He put me on a program. And he told me, hey, listen, it's going to be a while. This rest of this year, you're not going to get that strength back. We're going to get it so you won't hurt yourself, but it's, this is going to be a long process. And, Tom, I stayed with that process, the exercises he gave me. I gutted through 93. The best thing probably happened to me was 94 when the strike started because I was just starting to get a little fatigued in August, and so I was able to shut down. And then, you know, I, I, I catch a break. Uh, nobody's signing anybody to free agents. Remember, they're calling the, homes, the Homestead homies. Nobody's signing everybody. Guys are in Florida and Arizona. Pete Vukovic, who I played with in Milwaukee, was assistant GM with the Pirates. He called me and said, hey, lefty, uh, hey, interested? Hey, we got a two-year deal. At this time, Tom, I have like three offers. They're all minor league offers. I signed with the Pirates. I keep up that throwing program, a weight program that Brett Fisher told me. And I rebuild myself, Tom, and from like, 97 to 2003, 
I actually got better and my arm felt better and, and I kind of turned it back around again. But yeah, you're right. I went from like 1989, Tom. It was me, Randy Myers, and John Franco, Dave Rigetti. When you're talking about, you know, yep. the best closers left-handed yep. in a game of baseball, man, I, 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 I was the classic penthouse to the outhouse. I went from there to, to nothing. And I can remember, Tom, I hope – I don't want to ramble, but, man, you get no. me going in these stories with baseball. I'm, I'm watching in 1988, we call up a, a lefty that we claimed on waivers. He pitched with the Red Sox, Tony Fossis, right? Yep. Couldn't break a plane of glass. He threw 86 mile an hour sinker slider, right? And I remember I'm watching him warming up. This is right, like like June of 1988. This is the height where I'm blowing. I'm like 97. I'm I'm bringing the mail. I'm watching him warm up, and I remember sitting there watching him warm up. And he's okay. You're in the game, Tony. And he runs out there. And I remember thinking, Holy hell! I'd be scared to death to go out there with that stuff. Like, <laughs> holy shit! He can't even defend himself, right? <laughs> Hey, guess what, Tom? Four years later, I was Tony Foss. That's right. I was, I was that guy. To say it. Right, right. You know, but but it, but, I, but look, you know, I I think it says a lot about your character and a lot about who you are mentally that, you know, I, I would imagine there's a part of you then and, and one of the most difficult things to do, you mentioned the guys Rigetti and Franco and Randy Myers and all you get, right, where you were that guy. Now, all of a sudden, you yeah. are more like Tony Fossis and those guys, yet those guys are still going strong for other teams as closers, doing the same thing that you were doing. Um, Hard, Tom. Yeah, I mean, but, but was, there a, was there a, you know, maybe a, a moment where you said, you know what, I'm cool with this now, and I can go on and pitch for the next, which you did after the Cubs in 93. You go on to pitch 11 more years in the big leagues doing that job. Yeah, what you know what I did, Tom? I, I came, I had one of those come to Jesus baseball moments, like in 1995, when I was with the Pirates. It was like, okay, how can I survive and stay? A couple of things. One, I've got to be durable. I have to take the ball every time they ask me. And two, I have to learn how to start to get lefties out. And I know you're going, learn how to get lefties out, Tom, from 1986 to 1990. You don't learn anything. When you throw 97 and you have a slider, I was like Norm Charlton, man. I threw 97 with the wipeout slider. He had the split finger. There was a, You didn't have to teach Norm Charlton, Rob Dibble, Randy Myers how to pitch. You got the hell out of the way. You just said, hey, warm up, get ready, use your stuff and go get it. And so I remember I was working out in the winter, like 1989, and Pete Vukovic is watching me throw, and he goes, hey, lefty. You ever throw a 2-2 fastball on purpose for a ball up and away to throw a 3-2 slider for a strike? And I'm, I looked at him, I said, hell no, are you, are you out of your mind? I'd never do that. Tom, Pete Vukovic was over my shoulder for like the last seven years. I don't know how many times Mo Vaughn, Ken Griffey, I get two balls, two strikes. I throw a fastball, chest high, they wouldn't swing at it. I throw a 3-2 breaking ball for a called strike or a swing and a miss. But you have to get to a point where you just realize, I, I'm not Dan Plezak anymore. I'm not Randy Myers. I'm not Norm Charlton. I'm not John Franco. As much as I, I wanted to tell myself, like, man, I'm, I'm still throwing good. I was throwing good, throwing pain-free, but I'm not throwing good. Best story ever. 2003, my last year. We, I'm with the Phillies, right? And I'm having a good season. And they want me to come back and play another year. But, man, I, I am mentally and physically, I am drained. And... We have a big series. We're trying to catch the Marlins, who eventually win it all. They win the wild card. They win the World Series in, over the Yankees. We're trying to catch the Marlins. We're like two games back. We have a weekend series against the Reds in, at the vet in Philadelphia. So we already see that the Marlins lost. So this is a game we got to win. We're two back with like six games to go. They bring me in a game, first and third one out. I'll never forget it, with my buddy to face Sean Casey. And I remember I'm like, oh, man, this is, a th this is a tough one because Sean Casey can hit, man. And you're not striking him out. Like that, that, the only thing you got to hope for, he couldn't run that well, is you could get him to hit it on the ground because forget about striking him out. So I remember I'm like, oh, man, this is a big game. We already know that the Marlins lost so we can gain a game. And I remember I'm like, okay, ball one, ball two, and I'm two balls and no strikes. And something came over me, Tom, and I'm like, all right, it's time to man up. If you ever threw 195 again, this is the time to throw it because he knows you're throwing it. I know I'm throwing it. The hell with it. Here it goes, Tom. I came set, 
and I threw a 2-0 fastball to Sean Casey down and away. Mike Lieberthal caught it, and I remember thinking, take that, Casey. Take that for your ass right there, right? <laughs> and I look up, I look up, you know how they have this type of pitch, and like in all the stages, you see what the velo is? I see type of pitch, FB, 88. I'm like, 88? <laughs> Holy shit. 88. <laughs> I know what 88 is. That was 95 if there ever was. And you know damn well that that 88 was juiced because if it's the home gun, it was probably 86, right? <laughs> <laughs> the next pitch, Sean Casey hit the hardest ground ball one-hop liner to Marlon Anderson you've ever seen. He didn't catch it. The ball caught him. Like, it just, it was a bullet. Four, six, three, double play. We get out of the inning, and I'm walking off the field going, <laughs> This is it for me, man. That was my best bullet. At 88, and I know that wasn't 88. That was probably 86. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great story. That's the one thing about baseball. I mean, they, the stories, unlike other sports, are just and, – and, and the people. I wonder so much, Dan. Yeah. You've mentioned some names, and, and, and look, uh, you know, we're, we're roughly the same age, and, and, and when right. I hear you say names like, you know, Teddy Higuera, Ted Simmons, George Bamberger, Pete Vukovic. I mean, these are guys that if you were fortunate enough and blessed enough like you and I were, you as a player, me broadcasting, to be around these guys, um, we were all so lucky. I, I wonder how many of the young guys now are getting around guys like that. Does that make sense? Not, it, it, Tom, it does. It um it, it's a different game now and in a lot of different ways. We are all different now, and it, and it takes some getting used to. We do a thing with MLB Network, 30 teams in 30 days, where you get to spend an entire day with a team, right? And I, to me, it's the greatest part about my job. You get to go to the Giants camp, and you get to watch guys throw bullpens. The coaching staff, they're all pretty much in my age. You're, most of the guys are older. They'll tell you about the players. But you know what? One of the things you notice, Tom, and, and I'm not blaming, it, it's just the way of the world. You walk into a clubhouse and you see, for the most part, guys facing the inside of their locker on their phone. Like, there was a time, and I know you got to, you got to like, hey, it, it's the way it was. And I'm sure you saw this, and I know I did. When you got the USA Today newspaper in spring training, everybody sat around and they were looking at box scores. And if you were in Arizona, you were looking at Florida. If you were in Florida, you were looking at Arizona. And, and you were looking at the box scores and going, oh, man, I'm glad I'm that guy. Inning in two-thirds, eight earned runs yesterday in Arizona. And But it, it's, Tom, it's, it's a different game. And I, and, and the, the only – I don't miss playing. I don't miss playing. But you know what I miss? I miss a Sunday afternoon in July – at 10.30 in the morning for a noon day game at Fenway, when you're leaning against the wall and you're looking up and you're looking at the monster and you're going, man, this is where Pudge Fisk hit that home run. Or you're standing in the outfield at Yankee Stadium in center field shagging balls and you're looking up at that black tarp in center field going, man, that's where Reggie hit that third home run. And, all, you know, oh, wow. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I miss that. I, that. That's what I miss. I, I miss probably what you miss. You miss like a big game, it, whether it's the Diamondbacks, the Cubs, the Reds, whatever team you're broadcasting. And when you're on that bus and it's a Friday night and there's two weeks left and it's a big game, and when you get off that bus, you're like, damn, this is why we do this. You know what I mean? Like, yep. Or you go to a ballpark that's memories. You go to St. Louis. For you, it's in Cincinnati. And, you know, Bench and all the guys that you're around, George Foster and Seaver and just all the names that you – it brings up – it makes you feel good. And that's that's the one – thing I wish now that like I would like to see the the, the players and, and guys do that are older Max Scherzer Verlander they get it they appreciate it but I think with a lot of the younger players with technology it's kind of taken it, it takes away the genuine love of the game the people the ballparks and the play you know I, I tell people all the time and you know this Tom there's nothing more cool and you've, you've done national games when you're doing a game in Yankee Stadium for a Saturday game and you get there at 1030 in the morning. And when you drive in and you get there, all you see are the lawnmowers cutting grass. It's a quiet place yep. that's going to be chaos in three hours. And you're sitting up in that booth and all you hear are the lawnmowers. And you're just like, you're going over your thoughts of the Yankees, the team, the two teams. That, that's what I, that's Tom, that's what I love about baseball. 
You know, I, I've been saying, Dan, uh, even the last number of years I was broadcasting baseball, and, and I, I looked at it as a dying game. Uh, I felt like, and I felt like in many ways, I mean, there were other people, and I'm not patting myself on the back, but I, I, I just kind of, you know, from what I saw and witnessed after doing it 30-plus years, I saw a sport that was slow. I saw a sport that was tired. I saw a sport with no action. Uh, the analytics were starting to take over, which I thought was starting to lead to the ruination of baseball on many, many levels. Now, some people can buy into it. That's their opinion. They're allowed to buy into it. I think these rules are starting to get – the new rules are getting it back to the way it was. You agree with that? Did baseball need this? Tom, 100%. And I'll tell you what I do. When I go to spring training and I do these 30 teams in 30 days, I ask players. And I don't ask the young guys. I, I talk to Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer, talk to some of the older guys. Hey, what do you think about this? You know what, Tom? They all buy in. And I'm to the point of this. If the players buy in, then I should buy in. Because when you were buying in in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, you were in the middle of it, man. You were in the middle of it in Chicago, in Arizona, in Cincinnati. Your interaction with the players was real, and you got to see that. And when those players tell me it needed to be done, like these, you know, four to two games that are three hours and 45 minutes, they drive you nuts. Like, it's gonna, they all said the same thing. You know, it's going to take some time getting used to the 20 seconds with a runner on, 15 seconds with nobody on. But once you do it a few times and you get used to doing it, I haven't met a guy yet, Tom. I have talked to a lot of players that said, these things stink. I wish they'd leave it the way it is. And if the players like it, Tom, I think we're going to like it. Okay. A couple, a couple more things I, I want to ask you about. We were talking about this before you came on today, and I made reference to it very early in this conversation, uh, about protecting pitchers. And this has been hotly debated for a long, long time, right? Uh, you know, Nolan Ryan came in a few years ago and said with the Rangers, we're not doing this nonsense anymore. And I had shared the story with the guys here about how Greg Maddox said to me one day back in the early 90s, you never really learn how to pitch until you can pitch after 100 pitches in a game. That's where you figure out how to get through the road bumps and the, the landmines and so on and so forth. Um, are we ever going to get back to a day where some of these starting pitchers are, are, are being allowed to throw 105, 110, 115 pitches? No, I don't think so. There, there, there's like five guys that come to mind. I'll tell you what, watching Sandy Alcantara of the Marlins last night, he's one of those guys, Tom. Sandy could have pitched on the big red machine. He could have pitched in 1920. Sandy Alcantara is cut from a different mold. But this is the, this is the issue, Tom. We are, we are wanting guys, we want maximum velo, maximum spin. And, and what you're getting is guys that are bigger, stronger, faster, throwing harder than ever before, but they're not built to last and they're not trained to last. And the day and age, listen, it, it is gone. The, the, the surge of Tommy John surgeries the last 10 years has been incredible. If you haven't had one, you're probably going to have one. If you haven't yep. had one, you should go get one anyway, right? Because you're going to eventually need it. Right, right. I mean, that's, that's almost the, the way it is. Yep. Tom, I, I don't think so until, and listen, I'm with you. I, I, I think there's a point where the analytics are good. I think the video and the technology for pitchers is so good now where guys can go in after an inning and these cameras can show that your fingers are like an eighth of an inch one way or the other. And that's why your ball's sinking and not running and you can fix things on the fly. It's great. But I think we've allowed, we, we, we've allowed, too much, just grip it and rip it and throw it. And if you know the problem is, they're every Tom. I mean, think about it. Every game you watch, guys coming out of the bullpen, 95, 98, yep. 95, 98. It's yep. it's it's industry wide, but they train that way. And I, I I I it's refreshing to watch a guy like Sandy Alcantara pitch because he wants to finish what he starts. He I call him dead brain heavers. He's not one of those guys that's just gonna throw it through the wall. Man, I, it, there's nothing I get more frustrated with when you watch guys coming out of the bullpen. They're throwing, they're falling down towards first base, spike one in the dirt, throw one up in the air, and they're saying, boy, that's good. That's, you know, 101, 101, and it bounced. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's got to be some give and take. And I think, I don't know who that organization is going to be that's going to say, hey, you know what I want to do? We need to get some guys on this roster, pitchers, that can eat some innings. I'll sacrifice velo. I'll sacrifice a little bit of spin rate. But we've got to start getting guys into that seventh inning because 
this five and fly, Tom, teams' bullpens, they're they're just in shambles yep. by the time they get to June and July. It's well, just I the mean, way it is. Yeah, I mean, I think you can make an argument there. A lot of teams, it's going to happen here in Cincinnati uh, because they've got so many young guys in the rotation where they're getting guys out after five innings and they throw 90-something pitches in five. And that's part of maturation. I get it. But, I mean, yeah, they're, they're going to blow th- – they're already sending guys out six games into the year. Uh, in their bullpen because they've been used too much. I mean, it's it's just – it's insanity. All right, last thing it, I want to cover with you because I've never asked you about this, is it, and this is getting off the topic because I said it in the open, um, you know, you were heavily involved with uh, horse training. I don't know if you are anymore. Yes. Um, Not anymore, but I was. Okay, you were involved in it. Um, you know, look, I – You're an animal lover. I'm an animal lover. Yesterday was World Stray Animal Day, okay? We talked about it here on the program. But I'm curious because I know there were many times where you had to be around that horse training, horse racing world, right? But then all of a sudden you're seeing the animal that was sort of left off to the side and maybe beat up and maybe broken. And I'm not insinuating that whole world is like that. But what was that whole experience like for you? Tom, I'll tell you the best thing that happened to me. Um, that the horse bug bit me when I was a little kid. My grandfather, we always had standard bred harness horses, right? And when I got into baseball, obviously I had the money and I had 15, 20 horses. They were racing in Canada. They were racing at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. The tracks in Chicago, I had them all over the place. And you think you know a lot about the animal and what they're doing and you know what I mean? And, and they become almost like, yeah, you buy one, you sell him. He's no good. Get rid of him, blah, blah, blah. Fast forward, I retire in 2003 and I have my horse farm and this is going to be the new thing I want to do. I want to train horses, Tom. It gave me such an appreciation of the animal. And you think about like, just think about your pet, your dogs, like these race horses. Tom, if you knew what they went through once or twice a month, like just like you want to give a horse medicine, you want to get, they have a respiratory problem, you want to find out after a horse races, you often hear like, hey, they race horses on Lasix, that medication that helps them breathe in case they have breathing, like they overheat their, their system. Well, to find out if a horse bleeds or if you want to find out, hey, my horse didn't race really well, the last quarter of a mile, he kind of didn't have any pop, I want to see what's wrong. You got to figure out, hey, does he have a lung infection? Man, they stick this long tube that looks like a garden hose, put a twitch on the horse and through his nose all the way down and they look through it. And you don't know how many times I stood there, Tom, and I thought, man, if that that thing was an, uh, a, a human, he'd be like, man, you're not going to stick that thing up my nose again. And Tom, it's they're, they're majestic animals. That's all I could tell you. And from my time training horses, I had a better appreciation of the animal when I was done playing, when I was taking care of them myself, because they're just like you take care of your dog in your house, like they become part of your family. And, you know, unfortunately, when when you're dealing with with the animals and racehorses, you're gonna have, you know, people that take good care of their horses, you're gonna have people that don't. That's, that's it's the same with the way of the world with pets, right? right? Right. Um, um, But Tom, they they are an incredible animal. You, You ask them to do things, to stand there, and like they just get done working and they, get done with a race you see a horse like if you're you're watching on tv and the, the winner comes back and they spray the hose and you can see the horse like they're just huffing and puffing you know and and you think to yourself like man this thing ran till he could hardly breathe again and then guess what 21 days you're going to ask him to do the same thing all over again and you know they can't talk they can't tell you hey my left knee hurts right and you're wondering like in a race why they don't always race good tom they're majestic animals they they i had such a that was one of the hardest things when i left and I came out here to MLB Network. You know, it was a financial opportunity I couldn't pass up. But, man, I, I, I feel lucky that I was able to spend four years at my farm in Indiana training horses. It was probably the best four years of my adult life, being honest with you. That's fantastic. All right. Well, Dan, you've been so generous with your time today. Uh, I, I feel for you having to be around Casey. I mean, his act gets tired <laughs> in a hurry. I mean, he gets tired in a hurry, man. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do That's it. That's a – <laughs> he's the best. I tell you what, he's got a zest for life, and he he's got a passion for everything he does, and it's infectious. Well, you do too, Dan. And, you, and I said yesterday Thanks, when we, we talked about having you on, you, you're one of the best guys I ever had a chance to meet in the game of baseball. And I can't thank you for back in those days, and can't thank you enough for today, my friend. All the best to you, Tom. Tom, you're you're great at what you do, and you still are. And I hope you get a chance to do it again. Well, thank you, Danny. I appreciate that very much. Have a great day. You got it, Tommy. Be good. All right, man. Danny, please sack. 
One of the all-time How good is that guy?